Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm hopeful that uh, this topic, fortifying business with zero trust security, is something that everyone's looking forward to learning about. Um, before we get started, I want to allow um, the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, I'll, I'll give a very short introduction for myself in addition to what's already been said. Thank you very much. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll let Frankie and, and Lee uh, introduce themselves. And if another of our panelists joins, um, we'll, we'll do a quick introduction, no matter where we are in the presentation. Um, very quickly, I'm currently living in the United States, but I used to live in Singapore. Um, I also uh, lived and worked in New Zealand. Um, I'm not uh, giving a US-centric viewpoint. I've lived and worked outside the US, and although I have an American accent, I believe I, I understand what goes on around the world. Uh, I did work for Dimension Data in Singapore and was responsible for incident response computer forensics for them um, for, for a year um, when, I, when I lived there about 10 years ago. Um, Frankie, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. So this is Frankie. I'm working for UBS Bank based in Singapore as well. So I'm taking care of the cyber attack risk for the UBS franchise in Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. For those not familiar with UBS, UBS is the largest bank in Switzerland, but also the largest private bank globally. We're also the top tier investment bank and asset management bank as well. Before my life with UBS, I was working in Citibank, so regional information security office. So we are covering 17 markets in Asia Pacific here, covering all the line of business of the banking, the product service here. Very happy to be here to exchange the ideas with other panelists and Eric, you as well. Back to you. Thank you very much. All right, Lee, how about uh, an introduction for you? Yeah, uh, Lee Dolson. So I run the, the architecture team here at Zscaler, which is a team that works with customers to just you know understand what the a transformation journey looks like as they start to shift more and more to cloud, as they start to look at you know the deperimeterization and some of these strategies around zero trust and you know security in the cloud. I've been I'm based in Singapore. I've been here now uh, in Asia for about 15, 16 years, I think. Um, uh, last uh, almost 10 years here with Zscaler, working with customers on these sorts of initiatives. And before that, I was with more uh, more traditional uh, on-premise security vendor. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, very familiar with a lot of the challenges people uh, deal with here in Southeast Asia. Perfect. Thank you very much, Lee. All right. Um, just to set expectations um, for today, we're, we just went through the introductions. Frankie is going to set... Um, us up for a description of, of zero trust. And then we have five pre-scripted pre questions that we'll go through as a panel and then open it up for Q&A. So with no further ado, Frankie, um, a little bit about zero trust. Okay, thank you, Eric. To let everyone is on the same page, let me explain what is zero trust briefly and its history for us. So the main concept behind zero trust Actually, simply, never trust, always verify. It is the idea that organizations should not trust anyone or anything inside or outside of your premise by default. Rather, you should always verify anyone or anything that tries to connect your network before granting access and on an ongoing basis as well. So the name Zero Trust was first created in 1994 by a guy called Steven for his PhD paper on the computational society security in university. But only until 2010, which is 11 years ago, Zero Trust became the commonly known in the industry to the guy called Jung, who was an analyst at the Forest Research at the time. Then four years later, in 2014, which is seven years ago, Google largely deployed Beyond Corp, which is first version commercialized implementation of Zero Trust security model well known to industry that shift access control from network parameter to the individual user and identity device. Yeah, back to you, Eric. Thank you very much, Frankie. You know, it used to be trust but verify, 
Now it's, we can't really trust anything until we verify. <laughs> a little bit of a change. All right. So um, we, have, we have some pre-scripted questions. Lee, I'm going to start with you on the first question. Um, are there leading practices for building, adopting, and implementing zero trust security? Would NIST SP800-207, zero trust architecture, be a useful input? Yeah, yeah. I, obviously, there's a lot of uh, best practices. Like, uh, like Frankie said, it's uh, never trust, always verify. So a lot of that comes down to uh, identity. Right, you need to you know, understand like who is the user, and so you know that, that's kind of one of the fundamentals of zero trust is what is your identity, uh, what are you looking at in terms of identity? You can't have zero trust if you don't have some level of identity, and you know the identity though you know different strategies for different areas. So when you talk about users, that's traditional user authentication and identity, but when you you know you look at NIST, the NIST framework is is very good. Um, you know, it's talking not just about users, it talks about the concept of a subject. So it extends it to machines and machine to machine and OT, which is all relevant to, to zero trust. Uh, but you still need to think in terms of almost like identity. Fundamentally, it might be a machine identity, it might be a user identity. And then, you know, the various things of, around posture assessment and context. So I think the this document is great, especially at the abstract level when you read that. Uh, of just talking about that fundamental deprimitarization. You know, the, the core idea here is we're no longer using the network as a point of trust. Historically, you walk into a building and you say, okay, well, I'm in the office, therefore I'm trusted just by the fact that I'm sitting here in the office. And, and that's what we're shifting away from with zero trust. Um, and I'd say where the, the NIST stock is, uh, a couple of things with the NIST stock as I read through it, it definitely talks about the role of traditional network security. I think there can be some confusion. Net, traditional network security can be used to implement zero trust, but it also highlights the challenges around if you really try to embrace firewalls in traditional security, you'll, you'll wind up with an operational nightmare. So things like Beyond Corp and, and new ways of approaching zero trust give you much more operational efficiency. I'd say the other area where NIST uh, focuses really on the access control and identity angle, but the other part of zero trust is thinking about use identity and posture and context to say, what's the user experience? What's the type of security I want to apply on this particular session? Because I can choose different types of security to actually apply to the session itself using the same zero trust principles. So I'd also say the Gartner SASE framework is a great resource because it zero trust is a component of that, but it also touches on what are the bits of security that feed into it as well that you can leverage? Really like that. Um, one of the things I've found is um, uh, IEEE has a standard for device IDs, 802.1AR, which of course no one knows anything about unless you're really an I, IEEE nerd. But right. it's, it's really interesting how there are pieces, bits and pieces all over the place that we could actually leverage to improve our understanding of what is connecting to us. Um, Frankie, I was hoping you could give us a little bit more context. Okay, so the question is about the standard for zero trust, right? To be honest, there are a few already in the industry. One of them, as you mentioned, is NIST 100-207. This is actually the, I would say the vendor neutral comprehensive standard, not only for government entities, but also for the organizations in the industry as well. So just something to share in US as a response to the increasing number of high profile security breaches. In May this year, US President Administration issued executive order mandating US federal agencies adhere to this NIST 800-237 standard as a required step for zero trust implementation for those uh, vendors of the government agencies. As a result, this standard has gone through heavy validation and puts from a range of commercial customers, vendors, and government agencies, stakeholders, which is why many private organizations view it, this standard as a de facto standard for private enterprise of implementation of their trust as well. Yeah, back to you, Harry. Thank you, Frankie. Um, before we continue, I want to let Mel uh, introduce herself. Um, go ahead, Mel, a uh, little bit about you, company, location, 
uh, that that special thing that makes you unique. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Mel Magrino. I'm the vice president in the group CISA of Meralco. Meralco is the largest power distribution unit in the Philippines. So I take care of the enterprise IT as well as the infrastructure around ICS. Um, and then concurrently, I am also that uh, I'm also the chairman and the president of the Women in Security Alliance Philippines. So uh, what's interesting about me, um, I have an advocacy for women empowerment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mel. So we were um, the the lead question here was around uh, leading practices for building, adopting and implementing zero trust and whether frameworks like uh, NIST SP 800-207, the zero trust architecture would be useful. If you have any additional context, you know, or please feel free to add it. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll just proceed with the next, the next item. Um, or all right. So actually, in terms of the um, NIST framework, it's something that we are actually um, adopting here in our organization. So not only within the, within the enterprise IT, but as well as in, in our SCADA environment. And like right now, uh, we are actually evolving or we are already embracing the IT and OT convergence as we are doing a massive rollout of uh, smart meters. Hence, um, both actually both contexts on the zero trust network access and the ZTAA, which is actually the zero trust application access as well. These are actually the two security models that we are, that we are adopting across the organization. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. You know, what's really interesting is the, the group of folks that were put on this panel, we have someone in the Thank engineering you. sector, I mean, engineering, uh, electricity generation sector, with SCADA networks, financial services with its uh, compliance requirements. The Monetary Authority of Singapore has very, very good directives around how to do security. Um, I'm in healthcare and, and we have a, a gentleman that has been in depth helping organizations um, from the Zscaler perspective. I think it's a great group of people and hopefully we'll, we'll learn some more as the, as the morning continues. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and continue with uh, question two. Um, I'll let Frankie start off with this one. Um, how might an organization use zero trust security to go beyond a perimeter centric view of security? Thanks, Eric. Actually, the answer is already in your question. So okay. the call of zero trust, as I mentioned just now, is never trust, always verify. In the past, information security was governed by the parameter-based network security model. This model assumed that any user inside the boundary of the corporate network was trusted, and anyone outside of the corporate network was untrusted. For nearly 20 years, this idea of trust functioned as a justification for deciding which applications or which resource or people should be given access. However, as time went on, parameter security become less effective because of a number of reasons, including the growth of cloud computing, your workloads not just sitting within your premise now, but it is sitting anywhere on the cloud, increased use of smartphone technology, and the change in the way people worked. So COVID pandemic has accelerated this change. Now people are working at any pain, at any time, use any device to connect to the corporate network. So the old parameter security model is no longer effective. That's why their trust as a new way looking at the security emerged that didn't favor trust inside or untrust outside. Rather, the their trust model assumed all the users would be untrust and the ability to assess the network resource was based on who, not where the user is. This provides robust control of their trust from the identity access management perspective. Last thing I want to highlight actually is Although their trust concept is about 10 years old, but many fundamental things actually inside the framework is not new. It actually has been done by the corporates. So now we are looking at this from the holistic perspective, how to combine all this together. So yeah, that's why it's evolving. Thank Fair you, enough. back to you. It, it, it seems almost that Zscaler was built to do zero trust and to secure the endpoints. Is this, is this correctly? 
Yeah, it, it largely is. And I think that's, you know, COVID, uh, it's like Frankie said, a, a lot of things were already, people have been sort of going that direction in a lot of ways, just by naturally adopting cloud and looking at what the best way to consume it is. Um, and then, you know, with COVID, everyone um, suddenly, everybody's realizing, wait, everybody's working from an untrusted network all the time. And it's a great opportunity to say, wait a minute, I can, I can rethink what the traditional network looks like. And, and yeah, we were, we were very much in a lot of ways built for it. So, um, you know, we were doing the internet side and I'd say zero trust doesn't just apply to your internal applications in the internal network. As we shift to SaaS, you have an application that might be a SaaS application hosted with the vendor, but you want to use zero trust principles to connect to that. You still have applications that are hosted in your, your traditional physical data centers. Those aren't going to go away. Maybe they, they go down in scope. Um, and uh, you'll still have applications that you move into cloud, but you can start to, as you, especially as you start to do more and more pivot to cloud, you can use zero trust principles from the start as you start to refresh and migrate these apps. And, um, and yeah, uh, we added the, um, you know, the, the internal private access capability for connecting to your traditional data center or apps in the cloud and back in 2016. And it's like Frankie said, some of these concepts have been around for a long time, but I would say it wasn't until around that 2016, 2017 that there started to be vendors proposing things that could easily be adopted by enterprises. Like the Beyond Corp example was something Google did in 2012 or 2013, I think, but they did that for in-house only. They didn't actually make that available as part of their own APIs until around 2017, I think, right? And that still only works in their, their side, but that yeah, we try to be Switzerland and be a toolkit that can give you zero trust, whether that's the SaaS or your to your internal apps. Yeah. Fair enough. And, and Mel, it's it seems like the pandemic accelerated this. How, how did it impact your organization? Um, well, actually, um, let me just share, Eric, um, some of my thoughts, which is precisely um, same principles that we're actually adopting. So the way we look at it is that um, zero trust um, security can be applied into several ways, depending on your overall architectural design and approach. So I think let's go back to some of the basics, right? So to better understand ZT, so we need to distinguish um, actually the security models, which that's also practically our approach here in Meralco. So I think echoing on what I have just mentioned earlier, right, on the ZTNA, which is our zero trust network access, and you also have your zero trust double A, right? So ZTNA um, usually refers to your software defined perimeter, which is the most common implementation of your ZT model. So based on your micro segmentation approach and network isolation. So this one actually replaces our traditional VPN, which right now this is um, this is something that we are currently um, embarking. And of course, grants access uh, for your uh, for your network after um, after a series of verification and authentication. But um, it shouldn't stop there. So our approach is that we also look at um, application, right? So um, there goes your, um, your zero trust application access, uh, which also operates under the ZT set of principles. But, but unlike ZTNA, the ZTAA, it goes, I think, uh, a step further to actually protect not just your, your network, but most especially your core applications. And these core applications, uh, based on the risk assessment that we have performed, uh, uh, would be those that would actually support our critical operations to support our country, right? And as well as those applications that would actually hold personal data. Um, so ZT... Um, ZTAA assumes all networks are actually compromised and limits access going to the applications until after users and devices have been verified. So this approach um, effectively blocks, uh, blocks the attackers that enter the network and protects actually the connected application. So practically, that's how we are, we are doing it. And that's how we are slowly evolving, going to that you know, security um, um, model. Thank you. Mel, uh, would it be OK if I followed up with, with question three? Because I think it actually follows exactly what you just were talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, how can zero trust improve user authentication and authorization? Because it seems to follow completely what you said. Mm, okay, so um, 
Um, so in in zero trust, so you look at your resource, your data, and your user, right? So your resource could be your device. So um, user and device access provisioning is a key component of your ZT, of your overall ZT architecture. So um, there has to be a zero trust policy uh, that should be in place. So this um, ZT policy needs to um, needs to actually determine if attempted connections are really authorized, right? Or if there is really a vetted um, business justification to, to authorize the connection going to a specific resource within a specific network segment. So if the ZT policy has insufficient information or it, uh, or it deviates um, certain um, risk policies or I would say risk rules to actually identify associated subjects and resources, then the assessment of allowing or disallowing an access will be compromised. So meaning you cannot really fulfill the whole equation, right? So in most cases, your session could be dropped or your request could be dropped. Uh, it defeats the purpose of providing minimum access to your users and to your resources as well. Hence, um, strong user and device um, actually provisioning process as well as authentication policies need to be in place before moving to a more zero trust aligned deployments. Okay, thank you. I was, um, Frankie or Lee, if you'd like to add on to this, I'd, I'd like you to also think about what happens when you, when you look at authentication and authorization um, is it easier to implement an attack that creates a race condition where authorization will occur prior to authentication? Is it easier when you're, when you're trying to do this over a wide area network, um, you know, people from home, people from all over the world trying to access resources? Is it easier or more difficult? Actually, the simple answer is yes. And no. So instead of actually giving a, how to say, the theoretic explanation, I want to give a real example, which is okay. two-factor authentication, 2FA. So some people may think 2FA is zero trust in the authentication world. So when we move to the zero trust, everything has to enable 2FA. It is not as simple as that. There are some, actually the implementations is really a risk-based approach to implement the 2FA in the zero trust model. Some things actually you can do is simplification plus simplification as the guy just mentioned. So consolidating and integrating your on-premise and the cloud fragmented access control framework like single on Active Directory, et cetera, into one unified one core identity control platform. It is not must to do, but it is good to do this make cost you some effort at the beginning, but along the way, this it will give you a lot of benefit to better manage your staff and your clients access to the network and the resource. Second thing, as Mel just mentioned, is about the policy. So baseline, the policy is very important. This means you have to gather enough insights by the user, who they are. Are they in a risky user group? Application insights, which applications the user is trying to assess. Device insights, do we recognize the device? What is the security posture? What is the latest operating system? Location, where's the user? Where's the device coming from? And the network character, etc. And applying all this and unify them so that we have a fully better understanding of the insights of the behind before the user requests come in. So that the policy could be set up to allow the seamless access to manage device from corporate network, but at the same time, for unmanaged device logging from new location could be prompt for the to FA. So that's why this is a risk-based approach. Last but not least is a continuous monitoring. This is tied to the always verify part of their trust. So the mean, this means authentication no longer only happen at once at the beginning when you assess network for the first time, but has to be continuously throughout the user whole journey to adaptive risk-based assessment to identify the potential threats. This is further enhancement on the point to adjust shared security policy could be enhanced based on your organization's overall risk tolerance and risk appetite and based on those insights throughout the continuous monitoring so that you can determine whether promote for the second factor or not or this will increase security posture but also simplifying the end user experience 
Yep, back to you, Ari. Fair enough. Uh, Lee, would you like to add on to this or? Yeah, yeah I think uh, Frankie and, um, and, uh, and Mel just touched on some good points, which I'd like to reinforce. So, you know, one thing we're doing, particularly with managed endpoints, is we're typically enrolling those endpoints. And so at that point, it's like Frankie said, we decide when, you know, there, there was an authentication that happened at that enrollment time. And then it's based on the, the authentication policies and the risk appetite for the organization. When do you want to step up or, or create a, an authentication event to happen? It doesn't have to happen all the time. It doesn't have to happen for the majority of kind of common apps that many users use. So a lot of times the user experience can be greatly improved. And I think when it comes to unmanaged devices, this is where as the industry shifts to more um, SAML based solutions where an unmanaged device, your, your identity is in the cloud and you've already from that device probably connected to something. So that, that authentication service already knows who you are. You can have a lot of authentication happening behind the scenes that again, even in an unmanaged context, you can say, when do I want to step this up? But the user's experience, they're not seeing constant authentication events. So you can really, really improve the user experience while uh, reducing the security. I think the other interesting angle here is as we shift identity into cloud, the, what it opens up for partner onboarding and third parties and collaboration between enterprises, as I'm sure Mel would be dealing with in, in the OT space with a lot of uh, partners and vendors that are supporting infrastructure, right? Okay. Yeah, I, um, I've had experience with, with a lot of uh, SAML integrations. I worked at a software as a service company and getting to the point where they're hitting their portal, they're doing automated provisioning on our environment. It simplifies end users uh, situation tremendously. Usability yeah. goes up and, and problems and calls go way down. So I, I appreciate the context. All right, um, Lee, I'm going to let you go on the next, uh, the next question. Um, how has network-wide visibility changed over the past few years, and how does it impact zero trust security? Yeah, um, I, you know, the funny thing is I think zero trust actually enhances it in terms of where, you know, the invest, you know and I'm speaking very Zscaler centric in terms of the investments we've been making, but if you know the thing that's been happening in the network in general is people are looking at more and more cloud, they're looking at SD-WAN, they're looking at more and more internet. And so a lot of the traditional visibility controls you would have had inside the network, they're not there when you start shifting to more and more cloud. You, you lose a lot of that control. So the nice thing about adopting zero trust is now you've got this broker, this, 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 this point that can build that visibility back in. And so that's actually something we've been investing in heavily is like, using the cloud to be that visibility layer. So it doesn't matter if the user's working from their home or a Starbucks, uh, it doesn't matter if your app is in, in AWS or GCP, or if it's a SaaS app to, to use the zero trust framework itself as the monitoring um, to give you that visibility. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense actually. <laughs> um, you know, being able to see what all the endpoints are and, and no matter where they are, I mean, it's, it's going to help. Um, Frankie and Mel, do you, do you want to add anything or move on to the next question? Yeah, I'm fine. Just a thing one line is you can do what you see, but you cannot do what you cannot see sometimes. That's why visibility is important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, Frankie, I'm going to start with you on this, on this last of the scripted questions. Um, how does zero trust impact cloud computing in the implementation of controls to mitigate risk to cloud computing environments? And then Mel, you're going to follow up on this. Okay, this is a great question. Actually, the answer has been partially shared and discussed just now in the previous few questions. Just want to share a few more here related to the cloud environment, zero trust. So today it's often more cost effective to host application in the cloud instead of traditional data center. In fact, according to IDG, a leading technical media company, more than 70% of the companies now have their applications, infrastructures, or working loads already in the cloud. This cloud environment is operated either by cloud service provider or the SaaS vendor, not part of organization's traditional network anymore, so that the same kind of network control is not as effective as before, as a result, more, more complex, they have application and data spread across the multiple locations. 
and losing the insights, who's assessing your data, who is managing, who, what's the data will be used and shared to address these concerns. We have seen companies are quite often use a mix of different technologies to uh, such as depending on where their sets are, such as a mix of VPN, proxy, software defined parameter, et cetera. The mix of technology creates a fragmented security architecture, to be honest. Cloud environments are fundamentally different from the traditional networks and the continuous change, which means a company's approach to security must be both comprehensive and adaptive. So companies have to come out with a single unified security architecture in place that give user secure access to the company's application data across public cloud, SaaS application, and private cloud and on-premise data center as well. Same ex user experience to all the users connect to all these resources and controls and limit who have access to these assets and how they can be used. Inspect the traffic, enforce security policies on an ongoing basis. So yeah, so just a share maybe a few more the practical steps. So we have seen when people move to the, the cloud, the infrastructure, so what does their trust mean to them? Something like you have to know your application and data clearly you have to do the clear mapping of your existing architecture. Then you design your new architecture and you also have to baseline your policy. Last but least is monitor and maintain your zero trust environment continuously. And the last, just share some tips for applying zero trust in the cloud environment are use cloud native security measures to implement zero trust in the cloud. Provide yourself with a secure, consistent, seamless experience wherever they are physically located how they want to connect and which application they want to use. Otherwise, if the user experience is too complicated or require too much change, so it is, they will not accept their trust. The last is reduce the tech service by limiting the user access based on the context. Yep, back to you, Harry. Thanks, Frankie. I just wanna underscore something that's been my recent experience. I, I do some consulting, I'm a virtual CISO for a couple of healthcare software as a service companies. And neither of them have offices. They are completely virtual. Everyone's working from home or uh, you know home office. They're in AWS. They have no hardware. They have no network. This is the way companies, especially startups, are going to be formed. And we need to get you know get around this and and understand that as our careers progress, we may run into one of these companies where we become the CISO of a completely no hardware, completely virtualized company. And, and we're going to want to adopt these zero trust uh, principles in order to protect our organization. Mel, if you'd like to add some, some more context around this, that'd be great. Um, okay, so I think um, coming off from what um, Frankie um, shared earlier, actually that's that's quite um, extensive, but let me just somehow complement it. So in terms of our cloud strategies, data strategies, right? So this actually all influence some requirements for planning your um, zero trust architecture. Um, the, um, actually the policies around this would require an inventory um, of your processes, of your assets practically, and assess how data and resources are actually, you know, collected, stored, accessed, both on the on-premise and also in the cloud. And this inventory is crucial in determining what business processes and uh, resources would benefit from implementing the, the ZT model. Um, in the same way that um, data resources and applications, as well as services that are that are primarily cloud-based or those that are primarily used by remote workers, such as right now we have this hybrid uh, work environment where practically you know, um, good candidates um, to be included in your overall zero trust architecture approach because the users and the resources are located outside the, outside the enterprise network perimeter and are likely to see most of the benefit in use in terms of use, scalability, and security. 
And uh, I think the last one would be, of course, in a cloud-ready environment from a cyber incident response perspective, right? Uh, visibility is actually um, very crucial. So we also need to make sure that there is actually, you know, um, I would say, you know, um, a massive integration as well as um, as well as collection of the of the security logs that goes into your ISOC or if you have an intelligent SOC or if you have a next generation SIEM that would actually prompt your uh, security operation center if there are alerts or an alerts graduating to an incident. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from the audience. Um, so here it goes. Um, What's been the biggest cultural resistance you've had to overcome in your organization? One of you would like to take that one. Biggest cultural resistance in your organization. Um, I can take the question. Okay. All right. So like in our case, um, our organization, we're actually one of the oldest organization in the Philippines. And we're also right. one of the biggest organization in the Philippines. So um, it's actually challenging, you know, like if you speak, um, if you speak at the at the middle management layer, upper management, and more so at the board layer, right? If you talk about these things, right? I mean, zero trust. I mean, how it would be beneficial for us, right? Or how it can possibly affect the bottom line. So um, I think that's, I think it's really about the main blockage really is speaking their language and at the same time, translating this to something that, you know, that they get to appreciate the impact. So um, you need to make sure that, you get them involved and getting them involved would really start from educating them. So you need to teach them the fundamentals. I mean, of course, I'm pretty sure you've, you've got all of those things. But right now, the way technology is evolving, the way the cyber threat landscape is also rapidly changing, the basics also evolve, right? So you need to make them involved and continuously um, educate them so that when you get to, you know, socialize different initiatives with them, you can speak the language. I think speaking, understanding and speaking the language comes in crucial if you want to hear that. So Mel, wouldn't, you wouldn't grab a bunch of them, take them out to a PBA game and have conversation there? <laughs> uh, that's Might part work. Of it. <laughs> no, but but it's really like me really engaging them. And, you know, I mean, I deal with, you know, the, you know, the from the millennials going to the baby boomers, right? So you really need to explain to them. And if it's something that the numbers will, will, will really hit them, then you need to explain it, you know, from a financial standpoint, like this could be the damage to you, right? I mean, like, let's say one hour outage could cost like, X millions to you, and right. uh, and and of course other things, yeah. Yeah, I've I've always um, had had very interesting conversations where I I'll sit down a bunch of people and I say, you know, look look to your left, look to your right. These are your coworkers, and imagine mm -hmm. all of their families that rely upon them for support uh, in their lives, and you want to do things that will help them succeed because they're going to help you and your family succeed as well. Uh, it's one of these hard things, you know, it, how do you break this down? How do you encourage people to do the right thing? Um, uh, Frankie and Lee, feel, feel free to, to jump in. Yeah, um, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm talking, you know, across from the perspective of all the organizations and every organization is different, but I often see the biggest thing. Absolutely what Mel's talking about, translating what you're doing from a technology to the board and executives. But then at the, at that lower level, really, when you start to adopt some of these concepts, you're really, in a lot of ways, your, your infrastructure and network teams are really have to work much more closely with your security teams. And, and getting that alignment between those teams is one of the cultural challenges I often see. It does vary widely from organization to organization, but that's often something I see come up uh, frequently. I appreciate yeah. that, Lee. Frankie, you're you get Maybe the bad Maybe I can share last. one example. So instead of talking yeah. about talking to your boss, talking to your customers, so assume you are the F1 car driver. If you want to win the F1 race, so what do you need? 
So the answer is you need the first class car engine, right? So that's why for the businessmen or for the company management, so they need fantastic the product and service, the business operating model, business innovation, good, very market leading pricing model. All this for them in their eyes, these are the car engine to help them to help the organization win the revenue and the profit competition. But is that enough to win the F1 race? Only have the first class car engine? Simple answer is no. You have one thing you cannot forget, which is your car breaker. Your car breaker will help you when you need to turn away to help you slow down. And if there's any emergency, it will help you stop the car to provide safety for you. So what is your car breaker here? It is a security control. It is your risk. This is your last defense for you in the organization. So security is not just a call center. It is the business enabler for you. It is working very closely, both only when both car engine and the car breaker, they are working closely, then you can win your goal, which is win your F1 race. Right, you back know, to you, Eric. That is a fantastic way to end this session. Security enables organizations to succeed. I, I think that's, that's where we need to stop. Um, so, uh, thank you very much, Mel, Lee, Frankie, fantastic conversation. I'll send it back to, to headquarters now. Thank you, Eric. Thank, thank you, you, Frankie. Everyone. Thank you, Mel, and thank you, Lee. Thank Cheers. you so much, guys, for uh, joining us today. I think this was a very, very insightful session, and thank you for sharing your golden nuggets of insights on the concept of zero security and how do we fortify business with that. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a great day ahead.